and he literally hired about four tigers in cages um, to sit there and they were feeding these tigers in front of the players. Um, and all the lads are like, what is going on here? Like, this is, <laughs> this is nuts. So it was amazing to see. Like, yeah. you'd obviously, you know, massive cages of tigers they'd brought in on a truck from somewhere, from the zoo or whatever. And then he got all the lads in the team meeting room after and basically told us he want us, wanted us to attack the season like like tigers would attack the prey, <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, what a way to get your message across. He actually did it. Yeah. Hello and welcome to Rugby Pass Offload with me, Christina Mahan. And today I'm joined by Simon Zebo and Jamie Roberts. How are you both getting on? Very well. Season's finished. Just chilling. <laughs> Five weeks of nothing. I can't travel anywhere, which is frustrating, but just trying to enjoy the sunshine. 23 degrees in Cardiff today. So happy. Beautiful. Beautiful. All well here. We have a semi final to look forward to. Um, at the weekend against La Rochelle, so see some friendly faces and uh, yeah, enjoying the sunshine here as well. It's 29, 30 degrees here, so in Paris, so it's lovely. Yeah. So you uh, you had a Paris derby on the weekend, Zeebs, stuff from say that must have been some game like pressure. Yeah, and it was it was uh, the first time we had fans back. You know, we had five thousand uh, at the game, so it was great to see. Uh, you know, the, the atmosphere was hopping for just five thousand filling out that arena. You yeah. know. Uh, it was actually really, really cool. They put them all on the one side and um, yeah, it was great. There was plenty of Stade Francais supporters as well, but yeah, we were just a bit too strong for them on the day. So it was a good win. And Zeeves, you scored a wonderful try uh, in your game. Thanks to a pass from your bestie, Finn Russell. Mm -hmm. Talk us all through that. Like that was just a class phase of play. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was, um, you know, when we get our tails up like that and we get good momentum, usually down to our forwards, our big forward pack, um Finn's generally able to pull the swings and we got advantage on that uh on that phase of play so um I think he you know we he hears a friendly voice you know I think he the English voice outside him he just uh he he, he finds me a little bit easier than a few of the French boys and uh I just let him know where I am and and he does the rest so it's it's, it's very nice playing outside a fellow with a skill set like that you know that you can you can you can feed information and you know there's no limit to to what he can do so um yeah, it was a very, very impressive pass, and I'll take that. One for the highlight, really. <laughs> <laughs> I love your celebrations, but you celebrated with a few people afterwards, didn't you? Mm, yeah, yeah actually it, was, it was my last home game, and uh, the boys, you know, after the game made me do one or two points in the change room, or one or two beers, and um, they, yeah, they, they were very nice. They made a, a nice little deal out of the, the departing players, you know, being at their last game, so um, they had a big, you know, uh, I suppose a little tribute to us on the on the big screen, you know, like a few photos and just merci in, in between. And yeah, they tried to make us feel a bit special. So it was a nice touch. It was a nice touch. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you get emotional, mate? Um, after the game, when I was, you know, having a few photos with my family, you know, uh, after every game, the kids come down and run around the pitch and, and they love that. They're really going to miss that. Um, but then again, you know, my, my, my two eldest children were there in Thoman Park and they always talk to me about monster, monster, monster. So, um, even though it will be a bit sad leaving, yeah, I'm very, very excited to get back to, uh, to Ireland. And what, what have you done there, mate? Three years, yeah? Three years, yeah. I remember I did that game, didn't I? When when Toulouse beat you in the court, I remember being in La Defense and so I stayed in that hotel opposite the stadium, and mm. I remember seeing you on the uh, on the old electric scooter, just living life, mate. You had your headphones in, <laughs> electric scooter, cruising around. Uh, yeah. How do you reflect on your three years there, mate? You must Brilliant. Have loved, you I loved every second. Absolutely, I loved every second on and off the pitch. It was fantastic. Um, you know the rugby the rugby was amazing it opened my eyes a little bit what well, i knew I, what i was in for but it certainly opened my eyes into you know playing different style playing with such world class players week in week out and um yeah just being able to to let loose a little bit on the pitch a little bit more than uh, i was used to and yeah it was a lot of fun and favorite uh, night favorite nightclub in paris Boom boom probably. Boom oh, boom nice. boom. Nice, <laughs> nice, right nice. The boom boom the boom boom room. The boom boom room. What a spot. I didn't get to go there as much as my chocolate now, but it was still good fun whenever I went. Nice. Mm. Have you and Finn kind of decided who Zeeb's point uh, two point is gonna be now next year? Like who's his sidekick gonna be? I don't know. There's Kurtley, Kurtley Beal, there's Vera Me, you know, there's a few other boys that he gets on really well with in the back line. So he'll have plenty of options, but uh yeah, 
we'll miss him. Well, who was the best player that you um, played with and against over those three years? Ooh, um, played with, I'd say either Finn or Virami, um, for sure. Those two are really, really talented, really special. You know, their their highlight reel, really, you could see it on YouTube. It speaks enough. For outrageous ourselves. players. Outrageous yeah. players, you know. To play in a back line with the two of those boys was insane. Um, and to play against, I haven't played against them a hell of a lot, but I got I was very, very impressed with uh, Antoine Dupont. He'd have to be at top of the list. You know, just for a scrum half to be able to to dictate whether a team wins or loses so easily and so consistently. He does it every single week in the top 14, relevant of the opposition. Um, and probably his teammate, Ches and Colby, will be up there as well. Um, match winner with endless amounts of talent. So those two boys would be up there for against, yeah. Well, look, with the domestic season now at its closing stages, everyone's attention is turning to the Lions and their first opponents in the series, which are Japan. And Japan had a massive game against the Sunwolves over the weekend and got their first win since the World Cup. So do you think that Japan will cause the Lions problems in their first game or do you reckon it will be an easy victory? I reckon I reckon they'll cause them. No, yeah, I reckon they'll cause them. Are they favourites? I think, Japan, I think uh, Japan are probably favourites because they, they probably have are. continuity, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You, you're, you're, it's going to be tough to... You, it's hard to find form and and get cohesive that early on in the tour, I think, you know, and, and to come up, it's a good test for them. It's a really, really good test for them. I think Japan have proved at the World Cup that they are now in the bracket of, on their day, they're world class and, and they could take on anyone. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's a very exciting game. I, I really can't wait to look forward to it. I hope it's good conditions and um, Japan throw the ball around like they're used to and, and we see a good show from the Lions as well. It'll be a great game. Do you know, I'll stick with that. They have cohesion. They've played a game together already. They're an international team that have played together before. So, you know, the Lions uh, would have had a couple of weeks training down in Jersey. And then, you know, Warren's going to pick his side. Apart from the uh, the, the scoreline, obviously, you'll want to win the game. But he's just going to want to see his units kind of clicking, you know, the line out clicking, the scrum functioning well. Mm -hmm. The defensive side of the game, just certain pillars of their game that they're going to need to establish within the side to win in South Africa. That's that's what he's going to care about for that game. But rugby is one on the scoreboard, so um, it's going to be a fine one. I just hope we see some entertaining rugby. You know, Japan are going to shut the ball <coughs> under that sort of team. Uh, it's, it's not going to be a 9-6 a or a 12-9. No. Uh, we're going to see some tries and hopefully it's dry up at Merrifield. Yeah. So do you guys actually kind of, so you're almost kind of expecting that the Lions are going to lose this, this test game or this... Oh. Yeah. Warm up. No, I don't think so. No. I think it'll be a tight game, but as a cohesive team, Japan have a head start. There's no doubt about that. Um, yeah. Having played and having, they'll be used to each other as players. They know what they're about. They probably reverted. And then talk about the Springboks. Springboks haven't played since the World Cup final, but once they're back in camp together, they're used to each other. They know what the systems are about, etc. Jamie Joseph would have gotten back up to speed pretty quickly. Um, and so that's the challenge for Warren and the boys, how quickly can they gel as a team and, and sing off the same page? So, and I, you know, when I think about that Lions training week, it's, I think it's probably going to strip the game back, strip it back to basics. There'll be nothing too complex in the way they play that game up at Murrayfield. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a hell of a game. Exciting times, exciting times. Um, well, not to forget about the summer tours. So obviously Ireland announced their 30 man, a uh, 37 man squad um, for their summer tour yesterday. And sadly, there was no place for Johnny Sexton. Zeebs, were you shocked to see him kind of miss out on selection again? Um, uh, not, not too much. I, I think it's a good... I, I agree with um, the reasoning, you know, in terms of, you know, blooding in a few young players. You know, Johnny's obviously world-class in Ireland. The coaching team know exactly what they're going to get from him. He's the captain, you know, he's previous World Player of the Year. You know, everybody knows how good he is. So it's a great opportunity to give um, some younger guys some experience and, and let them know what international rugby is about because it's a really big step up from Pro 14 and Champions Cup. So um, obviously Johnny is an incredibly competitive person, so he will probably have not been too pleased, but I'm sure he'll understand the reasoning behind it. And the same goes for uh, Keith Durs as well. That was really disappointing to see Keith miss out as well, wasn't it? Yeah, but again, another world-class player who's, you know, proven his worth over the years. So, um, 
not that he wouldn't need to prove anything. It's just that it's a good opportunity, I suppose, for younger back threes and younger tens to 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 get in the mix and an opportunity to earn their first couple of caps. And what about you, Zeebs? Were you chatting to Andy Farrell? No, 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 no. I wasn't. Not with regards to the tour. Um, you know, I I wouldn't deserve to go on it either. You know, because there's people playing in in Ireland and you know vying for spots at the moment. I I'm over here in France, to, so. Um, I wouldn't expect to 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 play, or um, I probably wouldn't deserve. You know, I wouldn't. Uh, the same way I was kind of the the of the belief that while I was in Ireland before I left, I thought I should have playing, should have been playing. And now that I'm not here, I I, I wouldn't believe that I deserve to either. So, um, is yeah. the uh, mate is the World Cup a goal of yours in two years? Yeah, big time. Why not? You know, I I'm obviously behind the eight ball a good bit, having been abroad and you know and um, not have the opportunity over the past couple of seasons to to play for ireland or in, in munster so and um, there's some challenges obviously ahead but i'm very competitive and i, I want to to play at the highest level and um, so yeah, yeah i disagree with you there. i flip that on its head and go right you know what have you learned from abroad that you can bring the island side mm-hmm. so as much as i think you know you can you can look at that with two different lenses and obviously you're going to look at it that way i think um anyone anyone a bit reasonable will probably go hang on a minute you know what can you bring back to them so what you can you bring back to ireland from your time in a, probably the most competitive league in one of the best club sides in europe so mm-hmm. how old are you zebes i'm 31 there you are mate 33 peak, peak <laughs> 20 23 mate you played in france happy days but uh, let me go back to like johnny keith Earls. like now is the perfect time to take a look at younger players and a Wales have, have selected quite a few uncapped players, younger mm. players as well for the summer tour. It's no good playing Johnny Sexton for the next year, year and a half. Great. Touchwood doesn't get injured, whatever. But if he then gets injured a few months out from the World Cup, what depth have you got behind him? Mm. Like it's that they, they need to make sure they have two, three quality players in each position. And they're obviously positions where they're looking at and going, right, there's not actually that much depth or experience at the top level. So Carberry now gets his shot, probably. I think Ross Byrne is here the 10, am I right? Yeah. Um, and Billy Bur- is Billy Burns picked? No, it's yep. Harry Byrne, isn't it? I think. Oh, sorry, no, Harry Billy Burns. Burns Billy Burns is on the squad as well. Because I was, yeah. yeah, I was delighted to see his name now. But Harry Byrne is on it as well. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Harry Byrne, yeah. So it's one of those. And then obviously, you know, kind of young back three players, Lama, Keenan, these guys are guys who can now put their hands up and, and hopefully establish themselves as starting players. So it's um, it's positive for Ireland. And as much as Johnny and Keith will be gutted to miss out, mm. they get it. They know what's about. Uh, they were once those younger players who were given their chance. So, uh, you know, it comes full circle for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Jamie, I think we've spoken about him before, but what about John Cooney? He missed out in selection. How were you shocked to see that or, you know? Well, rumour has he's injured. Um, I'm a massive fan of his. I think he's a top player. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, it wouldn't surprise me come the World Cup. He's, he's in the mix uh, for the nine jersey. But, yeah, I'm not quite sure why he's not been involved. Is he injured? Is, is it form? I, I, I couldn't answer that one. But, yeah, big fan of his. I think he's a uh, he's quality operator. Yeah. Um, and Jamie, just on Sexton, so can you tell us what happened between Hibbard and Johnny on the Lions tour? Um, and was that the worst scrap that you'd experienced on your Oh, team? it wasn't a scrap. Luckily, it didn't make it to a scrap. Hey. <laughs> it would have been oh, very well. It would have been very well. It didn't make anyway. it to a scrap. <laughs> oh, mate, it was definitely. I uh, can't imagine Johnny's the best uh, street fighter, is it? No, I would have been. Seems, were you in Noosa? I would have we been jumping yeah. I swear, I would have. Go <laughs> on, you <laughs> Slight little elbows. <laughs> Were you in Noosa? You yeah. would have been yeah, in yeah, Noosa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just remember it, Test Week. I mean, I love, I'd love Hibbs to tell this story because he loves it as well. But yeah. I don't think Hibbs had ever experienced a, a player speaking to him and training like, like Johnny did. I mean, look, Johnny's a competitive bloke, mm. but it, it, it felt quite personal towards him. I think Hibbs messed up one of the plays. And we're talking about training three days before a deciding Lions test match now. So it's quite important, the session. Uh, and yeah, Johnny spoke to him in a way like the evils Hibbs gave Johnny. I can't, it's hard to put into words. And fair play to Hibbs. He did his, he did his utmost just to kind of grit his teeth and hold his nerve. But if he had his time again, I think he'd probably lose it. Uh, but it was a, such a funny moment because all the other lads were just like, wow. 
Yeah. Like it was, uh, it was one of the, yeah, it was awesome. Brilliant. That's oh guys. I actually missed that training session because we didn't have to train for the last two weeks. You're, you're hung over, over, mate. Yeah. That's yeah. really hung over. Shaking it, my baby. Yeah, oh yeah my exactly. <laughs> but we won the test match. So, you know, like I know, yeah. I know, you know, I've played with Johnny. I've played with him at Racing. Uh, I know what he's like. He's spoken mm. to me and me on many occasions like that as well. Um, but if that's what brings out the best in those around it, and that's if that's how we feel, he wants to win. He's a winner, isn't he? He's, he's won quite a bit in his career, so mm -hmm. it obviously works. Um, but yeah, that we all have our own little different ways of pushing people's buttons, don't we? Yeah, sometimes with sometimes with a player like Johnny, it's he tells you, and he'll tell you straight. And you know, some players can deal with that well. I, t I tended to laugh, the like, guy yeah. accepted, <laughs> I accepted it sometimes. <laughs> I just chuckle and double breath. Yeah. Uh, but some players took it a bit differently, and uh, but yeah, I don't mind that. I don't mind that in your, in your players who are in those positions on the pitch. I think sometimes it's quite important and uh, to have dominant characters like that and people who who back themselves and, and are happy to to go at other players if their standards don't match theirs. I think it's quite important in a team. Yeah. Does he ever like? Would he have ever apologized for like losing the head, or is it very much just like <laughs> that's just who he is? I don't no. think he'd ever get an apology no. from John. Never. But he, I, he, I, bought I me, he bought me a beer. He bought me food. And yeah, beer. yeah. He, As an act nice of apology, but yeah, yeah. he'll be yeah. nice to you and he'll smile it. Yeah, but I love that about him. I love the way he like. Even though it's not everybody's cup of tea, you know, he's he's being himself. He's not, you know, sh shirking away from anything. You know, he's expressing himself and what he's feeling. And he is a competitor. He's a, he's an unbelievable winner. So, yeah, power to him. You know, it wouldn't be my cup of tea either. But uh, um, yeah, I have huge amount of respect for him and and how good he is and what drives yeah, so. him. So, mm. uh, I'm so excited for next season. Even though I know the season is barely finished, but. I suppose just that the thoughts that it could get back to normality and you'd be able to go to the stadiums and stuff would just be amazing. So, for the United Rugby Championship announced today, oh, mm -hmm. which is going to be us. pretty cool. I quite yeah. like it. I quite like it. I like the setup. I like the fact there aren't too many games that clash with Test Rugby. In the Test Rugby windows in November in the Six Nations, teams are going to have the best players available. It's great for the league. It's great for the broadcasters. Great for the fans. Um, you play your so there's a Welsh group, there's an Irish group, uh, there's a Scottish slash Italian group, and there's a South African group. Um, four teams of four. You play each other twice, so that's six games, um, and then you play all the other teams either home or away um, as well. So yeah, should be awesome. Hopefully you've got Munster at home because I don't fancy Cork. Or Limerick. Oh, nasty oh. enough. Wow. <laughs> Take that Come back. to Newport, boy. Come to oh, Newport. Oh, jeez. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a warm welcome in Cork. Hopefully it's there. What do you make, Jamie, of uh, the South African teams being able to qualify for Europe? That was the only thing that kind of cut me off, Gareth. I was a bit... So they can now qualify for Europe, can they? Oh, yeah, yeah, through that. So it's one from each pool, isn't it? And then the rest, mm. they get taken out, and then the rest is on merit. Yeah. Um, Look, that was obviously part of the plan. I think if mm. they're going to come in to this competition, they're going to play in Europe as well. And, and they've obviously you know, brought into the Northern Hemisphere domestic competition, probably on a guarantee that they're going to have the best sides involved in Europe. Uh, that was obviously part of the deal. And uh, and say la vie. But what that probably means then is that less teams from Europe are going to, are going to qualify. So, mm. yeah, so I guess probably disappointing for some in, in some parts. But look, I think the South African sides, again, because it doesn't clash with the international window, we're mm. going to see the best South African players playing in those teams, whether that's yeah. home or away. The Springboks, Lions series players, World Cup winners, um, high-profile players playing in the league, and that's what the league needs. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's weird the box teams will be playing in Europe? In Europe, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'm all for it in the... In the in the domestic, you know, if if it means that the standard goes up, etc. But there's a lot of history and tradition in Europe, and a lot. Of, well, where I come from, we relate to that uh, quite a bit. And yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be. Um, I was just taken aback from it. I'd probably just have to get used to it a little bit. But yeah, um, I love that competition so much. It's just a bit strange now seeing. You know, South African teams in it, or they rename yeah. it. Will it be called the European Champions Cup anymore in a couple of years? I don't know. It's just, yeah. yeah. Well, odds on odds on the box being in the Six Nations within three to five years. As you well. reckon? No, yeah, I, think if, I, think, you... I think if I think I think if they if they're playing domestically yeah. in Europe and in Europe, 
well then uh, i just think if you're going to kind of synchronize the the global calendar it makes sense they then play in the northern hemisphere international season like why would they mm. why would they play all their domestic games in the northern hemisphere and then the international games in the southern hemisphere it doesn't quite make sense yeah. uh so i just think once this thing takes hold mm -hmm. might say two seasons three seasons it wouldn't surprise me one bit to see the box in the six nations but then so what do you do you keep the six nations do you lose you know a team or do you add them in does it become the seven nation like how do you yeah, see we, that work we lose we lose ireland <laughs> <laughs> good joke jb good joke and then, uh, yeah. i was hoping you were going to say scotland <laughs> <laughs> god knows how it works <laughs> Yeah, we, we're not sure, but that wouldn't surprise me one bit. Hmm. Um, we've spoken a lot about clubs' relationships uh, with their players lately, but did you see the accusations by the Toulon president over the weekend? So not only did he, I think he claimed that Julian Savea played a part in influencing Le Mappe to join Stade Francais uh, this summer instead of Toulon, but he also threw shade then at Le Mappe's wife saying something like she'd, was it? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, look, I think, I think too long. Yeah, look, I think too long of just, <laughs> they're not best pleased. They missed out on their star man. They were after La Mappe quite hard by all accounts. And he's decided, like Zeebs did, like I did, on, on moving to Paris and going to experience like one of the greatest cities on earth. And he can't begrudge it about that. You know, I'm no sure there's a great deal on the table for him at Stad. But, you know, him and his wife have come up publicly and spoken that they want to enjoy the city of love. And, uh, you know, that's, that's great for him. I think you know, Toulon haven't got the best history of, of treating their players well, have they? You know, there's been quite a few public fallouts, um, quite a few players and club owners, you know, Bujadal in the past mm. and the new owner as well, coming out and, and speaking publicly about players. And when players, believe it or not, when players go to sign for clubs, that is important. Like, yeah. you know, it's important to players. All players have got agents. They know how these clubs work. Um and it's an important factor when players play for play uh, sign at clubs, and you know, often with it for these clubs, their reputation precedes them. So, you know, I know the public reason La Mappa is given for go is you know to experience Paris, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit if if he's explored and looked into the history of you know players playing at Toulon. For all the success they've had, they've also had quite a lot of bad press around their relationship with players. Mm -hmm shocking press in the past you you we'd hear all the kind of stories and and stuff about you know how how different things can be over in france but one of the clubs that always isn't in the conversation will be too long so um yeah it doesn't really help their cause then that he's come out and slated him for basically not choosing his club the president of Toulon is oh my goodness mm. yeah it seems like a bit of a shambles but it's um, a pr disaster isn't it is you know, you actually draw attention to the fact that players don't want to go to your club. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a bit that it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but that's classic French, isn't it? It yeah. sounded like a very toxic environment that you'd have the president come out and over social media and say stuff like that. Like it just, I would have said it wasn't heard of. Um, mm -hmm. But Steve, you just mentioned it there. You obviously, you have heard of a few of the stories. So what, can you tell us about any of those kind of crazy stories that you've heard? No, nah, like nothing, nothing too major, you know, um, just rugby stories, really like uh, players not being paid, you know, for a couple of months or, you know, uh, not being given image rights or um, what else? I, <laughs> you know, if you're due to fly back being told after you lose the game, now you go get the train or get a bus or find your own. <laughs> Classic. Stuff like this, like that's I, awesome. Well, no Lawrence, no private jet from Lawrence if after you lose. No, well, it didn't happen to us, thankfully. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. that sounds crazy. Like you know, um, yeah. crazy. I love the emotion. I look. I I fully respect. Uh, you know, French club rugby. I loved my time at Racing. It was brilliant. I actually love how emotion, how um, emotionally connected. You know, the owners are to the team, mm. and it's something I'd never experienced. Really, you know, often. In Cardiff, uh, the chairman Peter Thomas would come in the change room after a game, um, but very sporadically. You know, you'd, you'd see him in the bar after a game, or whatever. At Racing, the chairman Jackie Lorenzetti would be in either pre-match or after the match, giving speeches, motivational talks, and he's just like, oh "My God, this guy isn't even the coach. He's just yeah. the, he's the club. He's the club owner." Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it kind of hits you for six when he first arrived there because mm -hmm. you're like, "Oh my God, this is nuts!" But they care so much, and Jackie 
you know, what Jackie's brought at Racing, I'm sure Zeebs has experienced that firsthand. I, I loved I loved my time there. I actually owe Jackie one because when I signed at Racing, um, I went to look for a flat, uh, obviously, as you do if you sign in a foreign city. And I found this flat in um, in Boulogne, Billancourt, which is where the Royal Garros is, Longchamp, and, mm-hmm. and Staff Francais play uh, the Sage en Bois in, in Boulogne. There's a lovely little suburb just outside the centre of Paris. Yeah. Found a beautiful flat. Happy days, you know, agreed with the uh, estate agent. He was awesome. And then I was at the end of my off season. I remember being sat at a bar in Havar in Croatia, desperately hungover after one of my last big nights in my off season. And my agent rang me and he was like, right, a um, bit of bad news. Uh, Jackie says you're not allowed to live at that apartment. And I was like, what do you mean I'm not allowed to live in that apartment? He's like, yeah, um, he doesn't want you to live in there because staff on say play in the area, all their players live in the area. He wants you to go and live in the southern suburbs and represent Racing 92. So 92 in the word Racing 92 represents the southern suburbs. as mm-hmm. uh, the 92nd hour on this one. And I threw a bit of a wobbly. I was like, hang on a minute. I'm a single bloke. I move into experience Paris. The last thing I want to be doing is living on my own in the sticks, like miles away from this, the city. <laughs> in the and sticks. I, I say in the sticks. <laughs> miles away from town. Miles away from know, the city. I like I want to be in the mix. Like I want yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to be experienced in the city. And um, I couldn't believe it. I was like, man, I can live in Luxembourg if I want and commute to it. As long as, yeah. as, long as I'm in work on time, it doesn't really matter where I live. Surely that's up to me, like where I live. Mm. Um, and fair play, went back and forth, had a bit of an argument about it, but he sorted me right out then. He was like, Jamie, fair play, respect it. And he hooked me up with a two king bed apartment right on the border of the sixth and seventh, and this and one, you know, one, one row back from the, the Seine opposite the Louvre in Saint Germain. Oh. in Paris for the same price as what I would have got the, the Boulogne flat as well. So I'm sure he did me a hell of a deal. Uh, yeah. So I do owe Jackie Lorenzetti a beer. He's a great fella, isn't he? He's such a nice guy. So approachable for <laughs> a billionaire, I suppose. You know, he's a, <laughs> such, a, such a nice man. Um, real far, family orientated and really looks after the club well. It's not like what I've mentioned in the past at Rass. It's not like that at Racing at all. You know, Racing's certainly the best from what I've heard in the top 14 um, and I couldn't speak higher of it. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time there as well. So, um, has, he, has he ever done anything quirky with you lads pre-season? Like... Um, he's, he's, he's done a few quirky things, all right. Um, but I can't, I can't put my finger on it. It's just, yeah. My, my second year there, right? So the training centre and Plessy yeah. Robinson, he... Um, he had everyone queue up outside. There's, there used to be a big tent where the academy um, sort of trained, little indoor tent at the back. Yeah, 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 it was still there. And uh, it's still there. And um, he had everyone queue outside the tent and let them slowly into the tent one by one, right? And as he walked into the tent, he kind of he revealed his teeth. Right? It was like he shook around and said, Bon season, bon season. Right? He re- revealed his teeth. And he went in and he literally hired about four tigers in cages um, to sit there. And they were feeding these tigers in front of the players. Um, and all the lads are like, what is going on here? Like, this, is, <laughs> this is nuts. So it was amazing to see. Like, yeah. obviously, you know, massive cages of tigers they'd bought in on a truck from somewhere, from the zoo or whatever. And then he got all the lads in the team meeting room after and basically told us he want us, wanted us to attack the season like like tigers would attack the prey <laughs> sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, what a way to get your message across. He actually did it. Yeah. Oh, oh that's brilliant. He's, he's so he, unique. Like. He, he's toned it down a little bit since then. So. <laughs> Is he? All right. Yeah. Oh, that's guys. He's a legend, though. Yeah, I couldn't speak higher of him. What a man. It's just so weird. Getting... You're like, what is going on here? Like, Kewin's getting this tent and he can see him, like, showing his fangs. He's like, yeah, bon season, bon season. Jamie? Why was it uh, yeah. showing his fangs? As in, like, you know, you've got to show your teeth and, you know, be ready to be ruthless with your prey in the league. You know, that was the sort of message, sort of thing. <laughs> but he actually hired Tigers to get his point across. That is awesome. Oh, oh my god! Imagine if he turned around and he was like, "Yeah, and if you play shit, like we're going to feed you to these tigers." And at the end uh, of it, you were like, yeah. "There's some motivation." There's a, there's a PR disaster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, that sounds cool. Um, 
Well, anyway, we shall move on. So the Premiership top four has been finalised after, after Exeter once again triggered an incredible comeback victory against Sale. They turned a 16-point deficit uh, into a one-point win when they were down to 14 men. Now, in that game, Sam Skinner got a red card for a high shot um, on Faf de Klerk. Do you think that that warranted a red card? It's probably impossible not to get a high shot on Faf de Klerk, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, I think for many of us lads, if you tackle normally against half the clerk, you're going to get a red card. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's, it is a red card tackle. It's forced to the head. I, mm-hmm. I had no problem with it. Yeah, agreed. Didn't the ref, wasn't the ref, like he was really good with how he explained it or something to the TMO. He was talking about how I think Faf hadn't gone any lower. So was it like Sam just didn't make any attempt or... To, well, so again, there was no, there was no, there's no mitigation. So you know, the refs now they look: is there contact to the head? Is it foul play? Is there force? And then you come down from there, and it, those mitigating factors are often, you know, are there multiple people involved in the tackle? Does the player dip last minute? Has the tackler dipped? Um, there's so many factors at play, but yeah, I know for the safety of the players, they, they go. You know, the questions mm-hmm. are pretty straight. Um, yeah. And they look at mitigation from there. And I, again, it wouldn't surprise me if the, the algorithm that referees use will change next season and it'll, it'll keep evolving uh, to make the game even safer for the players. Jamie, as someone who is super tall, do you almost like try and avoid the smaller players just because you know you could potentially end up tackling them you know, a little bit too high? <laughs> Without a doubt. Uh, <laughs> I've, do you know what? I've had so many instances in my career where I've knocked players out with my head. So I, I tackle, I come out the line, playing in a blitz defence, that kind of wrap tackle where I yeah. kind of wrap upright and just head on head and have knocked quite a few players out um, and been knocked out myself quite a few times as well. Mm. That's a red card now. And rightly so. Like, you know, if you're using your head as a weapon and not getting your tackle height right, it's, it's rightly a red card now. Um and so yeah, like fortunately, I'd made a lot of those tackles uh, earlier in my career than than in the latter last mm. stages. Oh dear, Steve, have you ever been tackled hard by um, by Jamie? Uh, yeah, a few times. Yeah, plenty of times actually. Um, I mean, it's yeah. a big head this one, mate. It's... Not by the head yet. I haven't, <laughs> Not by the head, no, no, no. I haven't ran into the head yet. No. Uh, Monster, <laughs> Monster Dragons next year, mate. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Oh, it's already started. Yeah, but hey. Zeebs is one of those steppers. He's one of those guys, you line up a shot and then bang, you tackle him thin air. It's annoying. <laughs> um, I try, I try. Uh, Zeebs, what did you make of the Springbok fans kind of throwing a bit of shade at Finn? Did you hear about this? No, no. So um, apparently they have seen Finn's creative flair as a weakness for the Lions and that they believe they can rattle him on the game line and shake him away from playing his game. And they also think that his attacking passes will rain uh, interception tries. So do you think that these fans have a point or do you think it's just old-fashioned sledging? Ah, that's old-fashioned stuff, I think. Finn's played the exact same way since he's you know come into professional rugby. Every single team that plays against them tries to do the same thing, you know, or says that they'll do the same thing, or their fans say they'll do the same thing. But when he, he when he plays well, he plays well, and there's literally nothing you can do about it. You know, they can be, I suppose, the box being so big and physical could probably be an extra bit physical with him, but he's still gonna take the ball to the line, you know, as flat as he wants. He's still gonna, you know, try his offloads. He, he's he's unstoppable when he's on his day. So um he will have heard and, and seen these things before and yeah water off a duck's back to Finn so I, I wouldn't Is really it, yeah yeah it's actually to the detriment to target Finn Russell because he's yeah. got such a box of tricks to put others into space and his kicking yeah. game is just berserk so mm-hmm. you know you, you rush out the line and try and stop that bloke all the best because yeah. he'll he'll just make you look stupid Jamie, the box have also announced that they're going to be reprising their good cop, bad cop tactic whilst dealing with the referees, um, which apparently worked very well for them during the World Cup. So can you explain to our listeners what this actually entails and then why is this a bit of a controversial tactic? It worked well for them in the World Cup because they won the World Cup. I, I think it's an easy association to make. One thing for sure, referees ain't stupid. They know exactly what's happening. They know exactly what teams are trying to do to manipulate decisions. So... You know, as much as we can talk about good cop, bad cop, you've got one player who's very, very polite to the referee, usually a skipper, you know, who's very kind of patient and polite. And another player who's questioning the referee, probably hoping to, 
somehow maneuver decisions in their favour or manipulate referees. Mm. What a load of shit. Like, refs no doubt talk about how players approach referees in their meetings. Um, they talk about human behaviour. They talk about, you know, how teams are trying to get gain that 1% uh, by manipulating decisions. Even more so now, I think, Zeeves, you probably agree, the amount of chat I'm hearing on the pitch at the minute when, it, when there's no crowds is berserk. Yeah. Every jackal now, you've got half the team screaming, you know, every decision, you've got lads chucking their arms in the air. You know, even more so now than ever, like the pressure on referees is is significant. So, yeah, as much as I want to talk about that, and no doubt there is probably a plan, referees are, are not daft. They know exactly what's happening. Yeah, I agree. Now, uh, we do have a new section today whereby we'll, I'll be asking... Um, Zebo and Jamie to fill out their all-time greatest lines 15, 15 and picking players in their relevant departments. So, Jamie, please pick your best two centres that have ever played for the Lions and tell us why they've made your team. Lions midfielders. I am actually going to go for two Irishmen. Um, and there have been some great, great Welsh midfielders down the years. John Dawes being, you know, probably the greatest Welsh centre to, to play for the Lions, uh, who's recently passed. Um, but I'm going to go for two Irishmen in, in Mike Gibson and, and Brian O'Driscoll. Um, it's important, I, when I was asked this question, it's important I don't look at it through the lens of the last 15, 20 years. Because it's easy, I think, for us professionals to go, right, let's look at Lions players from the professional era, or what have you. But the Lions has been around a very long time. Uh, Mike Gibson toured five times with the Lions. Um, he was on that the only tour that have ever beaten New Zealand in 71 um, in a back line littered with you know Gareth Edwards Phil Bennett JPR Williams these guys um, and Gibson was at the heart of that so you know I think he deserves one of the centred shirts and then and then Brian O'Driscoll the other you know what that guy has achieved in a Lions jersey is pretty immense you know in a one what he did in Australia albeit on a losing tour um, as a as a young man, obviously we all know what happened in a five when he was skipper uh, in that first test. Um, obviously, I played with Brian in a nine, and he had his influence on that on that ter- test series. And then you know, I was delighted for him to actually sign off with the Lions with a, with a winning winning test series in Australia. So it's a tour for the Lions four times. So yeah, I'm going two Irishmen: Mike Gibson, Brian Driscoll. Very very nice and. Yeah, I don't, there's no complaints here. What about you? Can you do? You, do you have anything you'd like to say, Zeebs? No, no, no. That's a no? it's a good combination. Yeah, I would have only played or seen Draco play. So, um, yeah, good yeah. Choice. Gibson was before our time, Zeebs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Fair play, good shout. Yeah. Um, and Zeebs, please pick your best ever Lions back three. Um, I've gone for players in the last 20 years. Sorry, uh, Jamie. I'm <laughs> yeah, that's a, do you know what? Like, I've been exactly the same. When I, when I yeah. ask great Lions players and what have you, it's very easy to look at it through what who we've known in our mm. lifetime, you know, who we've known as a kid and whatever. But, you know, I, I've made that decision on, on Gibson. You know, if he'd done that in the modern era, yeah, yeah. he would be the greatest ever, without a True. doubt. So you do yeah. you, mate. I'm not going to influence it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, I went for Tommy Ball on one wing. I went for Shane Williams on another, and Jason Robinson at fullback. And tell me now, what made them so good? Um, just they all have moments in their Lions career that stood out to me. Jason Robinson's try, you know, he's, he's known for his footwork and his speed. Shane Williams, very similar. Jamie will obviously have played with him, um, you know two electric steppers on either wing and then or um in the back three and then you have tommy who brings that aerial ability physicality great speed great finisher so they all have qualities um two quite similar and then there's yeah there's just a nice blend between that back three i thought and um i thought they would have scored a lot of tries if they ever played together so absolutely mm-hmm. and on the lines we will move on to our social 15 because the Lions tour is drawing ever closer and we do need to fill the remaining spots in our social 15. So Zebo and Jamie, who are you picking in the second row and why? 
Jamie, I'll let you go first. It's probably your oh, captain, actually, geez. after that video <laughs> of him doing the splits. Oh, <laughs> I think that's the only video that I... I, I... Sucking his thumb, what the... <laughs> Yeah, what was that? Can you... <laughs> I, can't think, I can't think of any other examples of Al uh, <laughs> being loose oh, on a night out. I mean, he, he'll happily have a beer with the lads, but I wouldn't yeah. say he's a looser second when I've played with. Sociable 15. Oh, it's a good question. It's probably from two, and they're both old stages, uh, both retired now, but every time we played the Springboks in Cardiff, I remember just going to Tiger Tiger, and he just saw the big silhouette of big Victor Matfield stood there at the bar, and Tiger Tiger, with his bottle of beers, bottle of vodka, whatever it was, just sharing beers around with the lads. I just remember, I remember it happening two or three times, Playing the Springboks in Cardiff, Tiger Tiger after. That's where all the players used to go. Zeebs, I'm sure you've been there quite a few times. Mm. Um, and it'd always be Victor Matfield holding at the bar. Um, I was going to say Simon Shaw as well. Uh, very sociable guy. Loved to drink after a game. It was always part of uh, what was going on. But I'm, I think I'm going to... have done the bar bars as well with Big Victor. I'm going to say Victor Matfield. That's a good shout. I, I actually haven't played with too many wild second rows. Because when you think, like, fellas, I would have played with, you know, people like Donnick O'Callaghan and Paul O'Connell and um, Donnick O'Ryan, Nakarawa. You know, there there's no one, no, no one that stands out for a social 15, really. They're too big, um, aren't they? They can't hide. Yeah. They, can't be, they can't be under the radar. They can't be mischievous. Like yeah. Really. Donnick has great crack on a night out. To be fair, he he loves to dance, loves to, loves to crack, loves to drink, and um, yeah. Is he, he any good? At, is he any good at dancing? Um, he stands out. We say that's I your wouldn't. answer there. <laughs> yeah. he, stand, he stands out. Maybe we can all stand out. Yeah, let's see if he's any good. Oh dear, he's a few good moves. No, to be fair to him, he's a good a few good moves. Um, but yeah, he's brilliant crack. He's great value on a night out. So he'd be my inclusion if we, if there's two spots up for grabs. He is brilliant crack. Have you haven't had a, a night with him, Jamie? Have you? No. God, I probably would have. I would have. Um, Was he in Paris? I've, I've done a I've done a Lions tour with Donica. Uh, um, and I remember him being a very funny, funny bloke, like just like a big kid, wasn't he? He's like a man child. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Donica. And he played. He played till he was. Got 37, 38, and I was at Worcester in his, his final few years. So, playing against Donica many, many times, and he just seemed like a bit of a joker. Yeah, Donica. Yeah, he is. <laughs> great fun. Great fun. Yeah. All right. Well, today we asked you, our listeners, to send in some of your best questions to ask Zebo and Jamie. And um, here are some of the best ones that we came across. And before we do start, um, yes, Johnny, I do remember you from your work experience in Rugby Players Ireland. You were great. So, uh, Zeebs, the first question is for you from Irish Rugby Abroad. Who are your favourite back three players in Ireland at the moment? In Ireland at the moment, Keith Earls, Andrew Conway. Um... I don't know, but these all play for Munster. Yeah, I was just I was like, that's true. <laughs> <actually." laughs> Absolute joker. <laughs> it's the truth. Johnny, get some favours before next season. <laughs> yeah. I know, that will be the truth. Um, I actually really like... Uh, Tieran O'Halloran at Connacht, um, Calvin Nash at Munster, another good player. Um, ah, there's plenty. There's plenty of good players, but Erzy and Andrew Conway would stand out for me. Yeah, I really like those two guys. No, none of the Leinster lads. It's just to say that. It's hard to do. <laughs> it's, it's, hard. it's hard. It hurts. You can't even bring yourself to say it, can you? No. <laughs> All right. Well, look. Next question, and this is actually for you both. So Ryan T. Wilco wants to know what your most embarrassing, what are your most embarrassing rugby moments? Jamie, I'll give you first go. Ryan T. Wilco. Is that's not Ryan Wilson, is it? I was thinking that. <laughs> I was thinking that. He's great at a fake page, the loser. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be calling him a loser now just because we're going back to Munster. I want we're not going back. He knows I love him. Oh, most embarrassing rugby moment. That's tough. That's tough. I mentioned one last week when I was playing for Barbarians and we were training. And I look, I was among a team of global superstars at the time. I was a young guy. And Nick Mallet was coach. Uh, we were training down at Richmond. And he's obviously, um, you know, I was starting in the midfield. He's going, right, Jamie, you're a big lad. Good kick on you. You can take the dropout 22s at the weekend. 
And look, I can't drop kick for shit. Like I'm absolutely awful at drop kicking, let alone <laughs> kicking the ball. And just in front of a team of superstars, like we went to practice drop out 22s and I absolutely shanked it. And it went almost nowhere, like straight into touch, like five metres past the 22. And he relieved me of my duty there. And then he was like, right, Jamie, solve that. Gets, take the ball. <laughs> <laughs> You're kicking. It was quite an embarrassing moment in my life. Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah, rough. It was, all, it was awkward. Jeez. Steve's, can you follow that? I actually don't have any embarrassing stories, unfortunately. Um, well, then, Zeebs, who was the hardest player? Who have you found was the hardest player to tackle? Israel Dag. Thought he was very, very difficult player to tackle. Powerful, really good footwork and really good leg drive. So he'd always break tackles. Um, I rated him really, really highly. One of the best players I've played against. On his day, he was unreal. I, I loved the way he played. And yeah, he was a nightmare to tackle, as was Cheslin Colby and, and a few others. So, um, But he'd probably top the list, yeah. And Jamie, who was the hardest player for you to tackle? Oh, God, I want to say all the steppers, uh, you know, any any steppers, a nightmare mm. for me. Uh, toughest player I've tackled, we played the All Blacks in, I think, 09 in Cardiff, and uh, ex league Brad Thorne eyed me up from about 20 metres, got the ball, just took the took the ball, just ran at me flat out, like proper man test. <laughs> my shoulder up, I almost lost my shoulder. <laughs> like literally, it's the toughest thing that's ever run into me. Um, and that includes some big, big players. Uh, yeah, Brad Thorne is the toughest bloke I've tackled. Damn. Uh, next question came in from J Jordan 12. That's a, that's a name I can read out. Um, hardest game you've both ever played in? So this can be provincials, whatever, international, anything. Hardest game. My hardest game, lungs-wise, fitness-wise, was last season. We played, I was playing for the Stormers, and uh, we played up in up at Ellis Park in Johannesburg, where the air is thin, and it was about 32 degrees at the height of the day. And I cannot tell you how difficult it was. It was unbelievable. I've not known a feeling like that in my career. I th- the, they went the length on about 73 minutes. And I kid you not, I jogged back under the sticks and collapsed to the floor. <laughs> I needed, I, like the lads, I think were laughing at me. Like I was on my hands and knees. I was that exhausted. Like it Brilliant. was savage. Like Brilliant. playing there, height of the day. Like you play there in the evening, it's one thing up on yeah. the high belts, but you play there at the height of the day, heat and altitude. For a big man like me, I was in absolute pieces. I'm going to agree with you actually. One of the toughest games as a uh, as a result of the altitude as well in um against the cheetahs in south africa played there for the first time um my first time ever playing in south africa and i just remember after 15 minutes you know thinking it was a sick joke like the, the way i was feeling my lungs i've never experienced anything like it was that Blum- bloemfontein in bloemfontein yeah 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 it was insane yeah so there's no training no altitude training that can prepare you or no you know heat training or this that and the other when you're once the ball kicks off a game is always different and you add the altitude and it's mental yeah oh that doesn't sound nice no, um sense. actually Zeebs, just to go back to the embarrassing rugby question oh you got something in your earpiece there <laughs> did you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, um, no, and I know Nigel gave out to you about this incident, so that might jog your memory. But were you embarrassed when you taunted Mikey Lowry? Um, and is that uh, why you went and apologised? Yeah, that's actually. I I wouldn't say embarrassed. Um, I regretted it as opposed to felt embarrassed because I do that all the time. I do that in training every single day. I have fun all the time. Um. It's it's in my you know DNA and my nature and I suppose it's not within the spirit of the game you know so certain things you'd have to filter down a little bit um, and I just got really excited and forgot it wasn't uh, a training. Um, what was it again? What was it? Were you playing a game? Yeah, yeah, it was a Champions oh, okay. Cup game and we were up at oh, fifty right, and okay. I was running one in and um, stuck up my finger. Um, but it was I didn't mean it in a nasty way, but obviously I went in, apologized, swapped shirts and, you know, made things right. Oh, so, you did. Yeah. I did. I did wonder, was it just 
sometimes I did wonder about it because Mikey is so small as well. It did yeah. it look worse because of the it, the way I don't know. Like if it was against someone else, would it have been as bad? I do often wonder about that. And yeah, I know- I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I know what you mean. But I, I, I don't, I wasn't embarrassed. I do, I do regret doing it, we we'll say that, but embarrassed wouldn't really be the word. Mm. I wouldn't say it's an embarrassing moment. Does it take you a lot to get embarrassed then? Are you just the type yeah. of person who doesn't, yeah? Yeah, I don't care what people think. Like, yeah, okay. If anybody knows me, they'll know that right quickly enough. So, um, yeah, I regret doing it, but yeah, I don't really care um, okay. for the embarrassing stuff, yeah. Look, that's the last time I'll ever bring that up. Promise. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. So another question came in from Maddie McNutt, and he would like to know if you would rather go the rest of your life without using a spoon or a fork. It's a good, it's a good question. <laughs> what the? <laughs> I um, told you. That's a very smart question. Um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. I'm going to have to use a spoon, I think, because I think a spoon can double up as a mm. fork i think i can mm. use the back end of the spoon to jab something and, and get it so i'm happy to do without a fork for the rest of my life <laughs> trying to have cereal with the fork well exactly exactly yeah. you know yeah you see that's the life hack now is um using a spoon to butter things as well because it just comes out really smooth you see yeah, that? Nice. yeah lovely I, it's a wonderful question thanks so much steve's always your answer <laughs> <laughs> whatever jamie said <laughs> <laughs> but Jamie, the next question is also for you. Um, would you pick Zebo for the current Irish squad? Uh, I would. I would. I think. Um, I, do you know what? I love players who go and play abroad. I, I just think it's. I, players can go and experience different coach environments, different players, different leagues. I think they can then bring back so much to to the club they then move move back to or move on to. Um, those different experiences can have so much influence um and even if it's just small things and you know Zeebs has played in a in a pretty pretty decent side in in Racing uh certainly for the last three years and would have learned things about the game that he can take to Munster um and certainly take back to Ireland as well and as an experienced player Zeebs don't mind me calling you an old head now but you are um certainly having that influence on the younger players as well but still playing at the top of his game so yeah without blowing smoke I think um, a good start to the season. Next season, we'll see. We'll see Zeus back in a back in a you know certainly in, a, in an Irish squad. Thanks, boss. Mm. Um, next question is uh, Finn and Damien McKenzie in one team v Moonga and Hog in another. Who are you both backing? I go Finn, McKenzie, for sure. No question. I think Jamie's question in that. I had Moonga is pretty special. He is. He is oh. any, yeah, yeah. I agree. I <laughs> it's agree. a good question. He is. He is. He is. Um, yeah, I, I still think fitness. It's fascinating. Do you know what the biggest, the biggest, I think, uh, jersey that's going to be most hotly contested this tour is 15. Yeah. Uh, with the Lions, with Hogg and Liam Williams. Um, that's unbelievable two players to be going head to head and it's so hard to call I, you know I generally think the rugby uh, rugby public is is split um, on that Hogg's a wonderful player I'm going to go with Moanga Hogg sorry really? to yeah. disappoint oh, you you nice. mate uh, you mate Russell mate <coughs> absolutely not each to their own I mm-hmm. I think Dave, Damian McKenzie is exceptional as well so um, I'd probably just give the edge to, to Phil and him um, but yeah it's horses for courses whatever you prefer uh, it's yeah or Robert Zebo. Or Robert Zebo. Good on you. Yeah. There you go. Um, right, Zebes. So obviously Leinster aside, and I know you do struggle to give Leinster any compliments, but would you ever entertain the idea of playing for one of the other two provinces? No. No. Um Munster's my home team, so um there's a lot of uh, I suppose loyalty there. Um, playing over abroad in France um, was always something I wanted to do so to go back to another province would be just weird I'd rather stay abroad than go to another province you know um, so yeah I love I love where I'm from I love representing Munster and it's certainly the only team in Ireland I'd represent Siebes last question Jason Murphy would like to know would you rather fight one Jamie Roberts sized duck or 100 duck-sized Jamie Roberts. <laughs> Say that again. 
<laughs> Sorry. So I, your... I go for one, one, one. <laughs> so one, one Jamie Roberts size duck. You think you could take that? You could take yeah. that on. Yeah, for sure. With a massive, bear in mind, the duck, <laughs> duck, duck, bear in mind the duck my size, right? Is like his jaw and his beak. Yeah, is gonna be like super big, like absolutely massive. <laughs> I take one over hundred though, for sure, for sure. That's, yeah, that's fair. True. That's fair. Yeah, it's good. Fair. Good answer, mate. Well answered. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That is it from us. Thanks to Simon Zebo and Jamie Roberts. And thanks to you for listening. More offloading next week. Make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating and review if you can. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Thanks, guys. Thanks a million. Thank you.